Tuesday marks one year since the war in Afghanistan ended. 20 years, $1 trillion, 2,456 American service members killed in action, including 13 killed by a suicide bomber outside the airport gate in Kabul almost exactly a year ago. It happened in the final days of the chaotic withdrawal of U.S. forces from the country. U.S. forces were sent back and evacuated more than 124,000 people in 17 days, the largest evacuation of civilians in U.S. history. On Friday, Cheryl Rex, a Gold Star mother whose son Dylan died in the attack, told Martha McCallum the message she would like to send to the White House. If I could speak to the administration right now, I think better planning is what they needed to do, and they did not do that. They basically failed our children. We're also marking one year since Kabul fell to the Taliban, as Afghanistan's elected government collapsed during the pullout of the American military. Joining us now is the former commander of U.S. Central Command, retired General Kenneth Frank McKenzie, who was ordered to execute the withdrawal. General McKenzie, welcome to Fox News Sunday. Jennifer, thank you. It's good to be with you today. General McKenzie, this was the president on July 8th, a month before Kabul fell to the Taliban. The Taliban is not the, South, the North Vietnamese Army. They're not, they're not remotely comparable in terms of capability. There's going to be no circumstance where you see people being lifted off the roof of a embassy in the, of the United States from Afghanistan. It is not at all comparable. And yet the scenes of Afghans clinging to the underbelly of U.S. aircraft were remarkably similar to Saigon. What could you have done differently from a planning perspective? Well, Jennifer, what happened in August was not preordained. It was not set in the stars. We made a series of decisions that took us to that point in August. The basic decision was the decision to withdraw completely from Afghanistan. There were alternatives to that, and, and those alternatives were not taken, principally that the possibility of maintaining a small, hard platform of about 2,500 U.S. and a significant NATO presence uh, to continue support at the ministerial level and at the, at the regional level to the Afghans. That would have given us the capability to remain in the country, to continue to pursue our counterterrorism objectives, and, to avo and we believe avoid the collapse of the, of the Afghan government. We did not choose to do that. Subsequently, after we made the decision to go to zero, the decision to try to maintain an embassy platform until far too late contributed also to what happened in August. Those are, I think, two of the big decisions that led us to the events that you just described in August. So in your opinion, was the withdrawal a mistake? I advised against withdrawing. My recommendation and my opinion, and it remains so today, was we had the opportunity to remain in the country with a small force. Uh, I realize the Taliban could very well have chosen to attack us, but I do not believe, based on the intelligence I was reading at the time, uh, that we would have uh, that we would have been forced to add more forces in order to maintain a, a you know a 2,500 force level in Afghanistan. We'd have coupled that force level with an aggressive diplomatic campaign against the Taliban, probably more aggressive than the. Doha agreement in those negotiations. So it would have had to have been a whole of government effort, but it remains my position that we had the opportunity to stay, keep the Afghanistan, uh, the government of Afghanistan running. If you knew that Kabul was likely to fall if the U.S. pulled out all troops, should you and the other generals have resigned to try and stop it? Well, we believe that Kabul would fall if we pulled out our troops. Uh, it was just a question of when Kabul would fall. And we have been saying that really since the fall of the year before. That had been a consistent position of Central Command, uh, our subordinates in Afghanistan, that uh, if we leave, they're going to collapse. It's just a question of when they're going to collapse. And the, you know, we thought it might be a question of weeks, uh, months. But as we got into the summer and the government of Afghanistan proved unable to marshal its will and its forces to defend their country, you saw an acceleration of that timeline. And But it was not, this was not not a particular surprise to us. General McKenzie, we heard over and over that no one predicted Kabul would fall so quickly. But you issued this warning on August 8th that, quote, in the last formal intelligence assessment I sent up on the 8th of August, I said, it is my judgment that Kabul is going to fall. I did not think it was going to fall that weekend. I thought it might last a little bit longer, 30 days or so. 
General, 30 days would have been September 7th, before the 20th anniversary of 9-11, when the president wanted all troops out. Did the president know Kabul was going to fall that quickly? I, I, look, I'm confident that my assessments went up the chain of command. Uh, I have, I, I'm sure the president saw them. The president of the United States has to make decisions based on a variety of factors. Uh, my input was certainly one of those factors, and I appreciate the opportunity to have had that input. But the president's going to have to make decisions based on a much broader range of considerations. Here's President Biden justifying his decision. Look, let's put this thing in perspective here. What interest do we have in Afghanistan at this point with Al Qaeda gone? How did you feel when you heard the president say that you knew it wasn't true? Well, our position has always been that Al Qaeda is there because the Taliban hosts them. It's why we went into Afghanistan in the first place. And certainly, Al Qaeda has been rocked back on their heels in recent years. But Al Qaeda is still present in Afghanistan. And also, ISIS is still present in Afghanistan. And both of those entities have a long term aspirational goal to attack us in our homeland. And given the breathing room to reestablish themselves and reassert their strength, we believe we will, they will do that. Here's what you told VOA. If we leave, uh, eventually al-Qaeda and ISIS in particular are going to go into open space in Afghanistan, and the threat to the United States is going is to rise. Do you think troops will have to be sent back to Afghanistan? You know, that's a, that's, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a difficult question. I know this. Uh, it is in the, the best long-term interest of the United States to not allow these centers of uh, violent extremism to grow and expand in Afghanistan. And I believe under the current Taliban regime, that's probably what's going to happen. The last time I was looking at, the, at intelligence, that, that, was the, that was the position we had. I follow it like everybody else does now in the newspaper and other sources. But I see nothing to change that opinion that, uh, that the threat is growing in Afghanistan, and it's merely a matter of time. To what extent is former President Trump and his decision to negotiate with the Taliban and his repeated calls to his national security team to pull all U.S. troops out to blame for how the war ended? Jennifer, the president, president of the United States uh, owns the final responsibility for these actions. I believe we had two presidents of the United States that wanted to exit Afghanistan, and they might not have had anything else in common, but they shared that common view. So you had a continuity of objective across two administrations that really allowed the events that occurred to occur in the manner that they did. And the Doha agreement, a mistake? The Doha agreement had the potential to be a useful approach as long as we applied the principle of conditionality. And by that I mean, Jennifer, that the Taliban had to live up to their half of the agreement. They did not. It was evident pretty early on that they were not doing that. But we never, we never effectively held them to task. Mm -hmm. The other unintended effect of the Doha agreement was to keep the Afghan government out of the negotiating process. And I believe that had a profound deflationary effect on morale, both in the government of Afghanistan and in their forces in the field. The suicide bomber at Abbey Gate was released from the Bagram Air Base prison after you left. You gave the order to leave Bagram. Why did you not close the prison or secure the Taliban, al-Qaeda, and ISIS prisoners there before you left? We had no capability to do that. Uh, we don't, first of all, we were not guarding those prisoners. Uh, they were being guarded by, by the Afghans. We had not guarded them for, for some time. When we had to go down to effectively zero, but actually 650 forces uh, designed to protect the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, we no longer had the capability to uh, hold Bagram and to oversee and assist those Afghans who were sitting on top of the prison structure. That was an effect of going, of not accepting the argument to stay at 2,500. At 2,500, we would have been able to maintain Bagram. And that was a principle, that was one of the things that was attractive about staying at 2,500. We would have been able to maintain oversight, not direct oversight, but support for those Afghans that were sitting mm -hmm. on those prisons. All of that went away when we left. That brings me to Syria and the Al Hol refugee camp filled with the families of ISIS fighters, their children. What concerns you about that? And do you think U.S. troops should still be in Syria? 
So alcohol, I think, is a problem that exists in two dimensions. You've got a largely defenseless population there, principally women, principally children, all very young. Uh, the threat of some immediate event to them, be it cholera, be it coronavirus, be it a terrorist attack, and killing large numbers of people is very real. At the same time, and along a deeper dimension, the uh, radicalization of children that's occurring in that camp is going to be a gift we're going to give ourselves five or ten years down the road as these ISIS radicalized fighters reappear. We have to find a solution for radicalization and reintegration into society for these children. And it has to be a solution bounded in the region. And that's going to be very important. So you know, the decision to stay or go in Syria is ultimately a political decision. Uh, we went in there for a very specific purpose, to go after ISIS. That fight continues, not directly with us, but rather through our uh, our Kurdish partners in the region. So that's a reason to stay. But ultimately, we're going to have to balance that and determine is it worth the risk to our forces uh, to, to keep them there. I would just note in the ending that if we were to pull out, it is unclear to me who would, first of all, uh, help help the Kurds maintain the al Hall camp, and second, who would sit on top of the prison structure in Syria, in eastern Syria, which holds many hardened ISIS fighters. And lastly, to what extent did the U.S. pull out from Afghanistan encourage Putin to invade Ukraine? That's a great question, and uh, probably not an expert on that. I would say that uh, everybody saw it and drew their own conclusions about U.S. resolve. I would also say that many times in the past, people have drawn conclusions about U.S. resolve, and they've been wrong. Lastly, General McKenzie, if the U.S. signs the Iran nuclear deal, as it looks like they're going to, and sanctions relief is provided, what impact will that have on the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps? I think it will give them added funding to further uh, to further support their destabilizing and malign activities across the region. Thank you, General McKenzie. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, Jennifer. Always good to see you.